I'm Rakeim. <laughs> so, should we sum up briefly for those who haven't been here? Um, we discussed uh, chapter 3 using the EOQ approximation and there was a few typos which may be not noticeable here. Um, the last inventory number 184 should be 134 and there was uh, a 7% difference that should be a 0.7% difference, not uh, important uh, difference of course. Um, so now we kind of looked at situations where we use a deterministic model, okay? Either we use the EOQ model or this linear programming system and we observed here that uh, the change was not dramatic perhaps when it comes comes to to using an approximation or the actual optimal solution. But uh, of course this is something which is hard to guess unless you kind of have a very relatively stable demand in that case you could guess that uh, an EOQ approximation might work uh, just as good as at least close to just as good as the, the actual optimal solution. Okay, so the next step would be to look at the newsboy setting. Okay, so now we introduce uncertainty again and look at uh, an event example on how to apply a kind of newsboy problem. Again, the setting is the same, it's about input. Uh, but uh, actually, in this case, we look at output. Because there are certain events who have certain side products which they produce, and in this case, it uh, kind of felt sensible to look at these t-shirts at the Molde Jazz Festival. Uh, the newsboy setting we have learned is a situation where you make a one-shot one decision. So you only make one decision. So you cannot do not store things here, okay? Because the assumption is that uh, these kind of seasonal products, or they kind of run through the event, and when the event is finished, uh, the value is significantly changed, typically to a less value. Uh, of course, there is nothing in principle impossible with kind of extending a newsboy into a multi-period setting. So we can have a kind of multi-period uh, newsboy system, which is then kind of a mix of these uh, multi-period situations we saw in the deterministic case and adding stochasticity. Unfortunately, it gets kind of tricky, complicated. We cannot find straightforward solutions and we need to use mathematical prog programming methods and of course if that is the case we have to have more than one uncertain variable and there will be a kind of demand in one period, one in another period and so on. It will have to be different typically these probability densities and there's a lot of data demand in order to actually do it. So this is uh, not very common in practice to kind of use these advanced should we say multi-period newsboy models. We will discuss it briefly later on. So, what I'm trying to argue here on, on, the, on the foil is in the sense that in most events, either if you buy input, like catering, or if you produce something under the event which kind of linked to the event, uh, you'll probably be into football matches where you can buy a, a kind of scarf which has both teams on, maybe even the result, or a t-shirt. This is a kind of in-event in product. And what's typical for these in-event products is that they kind of utilize the monopolistic setting of the event, okay, to kind of typically charge a higher price than you could outside the event, typically after the event. So you have a kind of difference here bet in between these two prices that you need to use a newspaper model. You need to have a price which is typically higher in the event and lower outside the event. And of course, uh, a significant demand uncertainty. That's kind of what runs this model. There must be some kind of uncertainty here and it should be be big enough to make it worthwhile to kind of look at these methods. Because if it's very, very small, you might as well skip doing it like this. So it says here that the newsboy model is an adequate candidate to handle one-shot events with significant demand uncertainty. And of course, this one-shot concept is related to the fact that you you cannot kind of store this T-shirt until the next festival and then sell it at the same price as the t-shirt for this festival. Of course you can store it and you do that. You don't throw it away. You, you can sell it either on the net or on the next festival or any festival to come and that's actually been 
be in the practice here. And you can even have situations where very old and very rare t-shirts get higher prices than these years. So you can have both, both situations actually. But uh, the normal case is that you kind of have an in-event price which is fairly high, typically much higher than the production cost or the buying cost, ordering cost, and, um, and you have a price after the event which is uh, lower. Of course, this is related to what event it is. Of course, if you sell paintings, you could expect that the price could rise, of course, if it's good artists. Uh, so that would be kind of a different setting than this one. So these are kind of the gadget situation. Okay? There are some gadgets you kind of put to your, to your event. Okay? It's logos and dates and artists and whatever. Okay? It could be everything from t-shirts to pens to there's a lot of different things you can think about, memory sticks, whatever, okay? You, you, have all, you have seen them all, haven't you? You kind of link to a certain event. So you, you try to sell your event one, one or several times more than the event itself by kind of putting in these gadgets. I don't think we have seen the end of this. I think there's a lot of creativity, creativity left in kind of producing the right gadgets to, to hit uh, different uh, events. You know the Olympics, they have these pins, you heard about those, these small metallic badges which kind of are sold, kind of collected. So th there's a lot of this, there's a kind of a whole industry is kind of focusing on event gadgets. So we look at the one special one here, it looks like this, actually it did in 2010 I think. This was the Molde Jazz Festival t-shirt, official one, uh, in uh, yeah a few years ago. So each year they kind of either get uh, good artists to produce the motif or they could have ch children to do it. The last two years I think they have used children. So the schools in all they have a competition. The best drawing, the best drawing comes on the t-shirt. Okay, and kind of a nice thing to embrace the community and produce more volunteers perhaps. I don't know. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they do it. So the question now is then kind of how many t-shirts should you buy? Given that you have some uh, stochastic information on how many people will come to the festival. Okay? If you buy too many t-shirts, then you will have to sell them later on at a lower price. Of course, you kind of lose some profit. If you buy too few, then you kind of cannot take out the willingness to pay in the festival. So the question is then how many to buy. In practice, of course, this can be done in many ways. Uh, t-shirts are particularly easy, aren't they? Because you can kind of buy black t-shirts and you can invest a little amount of money to produce a new t-shirt every day. Okay? Like, much like you do on these football matches. So if you have been to a world championship in football, they, they, there's always guys telling, selling t-shirts after each match. So they have a kind of produc production equipment, typically a mobile one, which they kind of produce these, uh, these right results and everything. Okay? So there is an option here to kind of uh, not defining the motif before the festival, but kind of keeping the moti motif a variable during the event, okay? So if you, if you, you can think uh, like selling a car, okay? You, you guess that the green car will be popular, but it turns out the red one is more popular, okay? In that case, you can, in this case, you don't have to buy both red and green t-shirts. You can buy a white one and then color them as you observe the demand itself, okay? Same with the motif. If the motive is not so popular, after the first day you can change it to another one. This as a name in logistics is referred to as postponement. Postponement means to kind of take a production process and kind of try to postpone it. Put it forward in time as close to or actually after demand signals comes. So you can kind of observe demand and see what is popular before you produce bigger amounts. So instead of producing a big amount of t-shirts which are unpopular. You can produce some samples, test sell them the first day, and then go for the big popular one. Okay, you see the point? This is done a lot in modern manufacturing. Very often you combine two strategies in logistics. One is called postponement, the other is called modularization. Modularization means that you construct a relatively complex product by a relatively minor amount of components. But enough components such that you can kind of change the actual product by assembling these components in different ways. 
Now, if you think about the computer, okay, a computer has, now let's think about the modern car instead. Okay, a modern car has a two liter engine, okay, but by using different methods, you can change the performance of this engine, can't you? If you have access to the right computerized equipment, the right pro program or software, you can actually change the man, the, for instance, the horsepower of this engine. So it can range from 85, maybe up to 250 by just minor changes on the software side. And of course, you would like to take advantage of this, don't you? You will have charge a higher price for a motor with more house horsepower than a motor with less horsepower. And if this can be done so easily by this combined kind of, uh, should we say, modularization and postponement strategy, we kind of wait for the market. And if the, the big horsepower engine is popular there, then you just do a little tuning to get a big horsepower. Okay. And you see it in, uh, I think about, if you look at an operational system on a PC. Now if I right click here, uh, prob fortunately this is in Norwegian, okay, now, and look at the personalize here. Of course, when you personalize a computer, you change the product, don't you? And you do it there. The customer itself does it. That is the best way of postponement, isn't it? Let the customer decide. Of course, it's kind of tricky with the, with the engine because if the customer decides, he will probably he or she will probably maximize the horsepower normally. So you wouldn't really gain anything. But in this case, leaving to the customer to change the product, for instance, by changing the screen saver or the wallpaper or whatever. Okay, of course, then you kind of use extreme postponement. So this is normal. If you look at mo modern cell phones. I assume that the Apple 5S versus the Apple 5C are not very different. Okay? Typically, I would expect more or less the same, same phone. But one is sold three times as expensive as the other. So there is some in-tuning there, which kind of makes a difference, so that the customer kind of defends buying the big one as, uh, or the, the expensive one as compared to the cheap one. Again, modularization and, co co uh, and postponement, which are kind of utilized to, to capture the actual market. Of course, we, we can do this, that in this case, but uh, the example we look at here is kind of not, not focusing on that, okay? Because that becomes uh, far more complex. Then it's suddenly we move from a single period newsboy to a multi period, okay? You have to observe several periods, you have to observe the, the actual demand, what changes is it, and then it, that should be implemented in a kind of linked time wise strategy. So it's far more complex. So we, we look at a classical situation here. And. Um, here is a few words which we already have discussed, I think. Uh, each festival has a new motif, typically designed either by children or well-known artists, as we said. Uh, typically, it's a cheap buying price. You order these t-shirts from China to cheap price, or from, some, sorry, I shouldn't use China so much. We have Chinese students here. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Olivia, this, this might be seen, but uh, you, should be, you should be happy, okay? It, it just signals that you, you do very efficient production in China. That, that's basically the the output. And a high selling price within the event. Okay, so you kind of pay a lot for these motifs, much more than it's really valued than basically that's how it works, isn't it? The idea is of course that people would like to to signal that they have been to these arrangements. Okay, I was at the World Championship finals in football in Brazil, okay? If you have a t shirt, okay, that's a very nice signal to send, very easy to send. You don't have to tell it either. You know, in the Western world it's always a tradition that people they don't like to tell how rich they are. They, they just send a very small signal. Either buy a Gucci bag or a, a Rolex watch. Or a, okay, that is signaling. Okay, and it it seems to work. People do this a lot. I don't know if you've seen these these television shows about these Hollywood wives on TV. Have you seen them? Yeah, they, they, there's a lot of signaling there, isn't it? All the time. Yeah. And of course, there is uncertainty related to the money situation. We really don't know. First of all, we don't know how many will show up, and we don't know how many will show up on different arrangements. We will show up uh, whether our t-shirt will be popular or not, okay? That presumably it has a link to the actual motive. If the motive is nice, maybe it's more popular than if it's not so nice, even though it's a signal, okay? So if you come out from the World Champions Finals, there are two t-shirt sales. One has a nice one, one has a bad one. Of course, you buy the nice one, don't you? Obviously, yeah. So. We need a solution of the Newsboy model. We looked at that previously. It's uh, not very complex, but somewhat 
complex formula involving an integral, so you have kind of have to solve an integral equation here. We will speak a little bit more about that after on the, the input is given. The first uh, Q star here is the output, that is the, the solution you're aiming for. In order to find that, you kind of need these four input elements, or actually you need three of them. You need the probability density function. If you have that, you can compute the capital FOQ just by performing this integral, moving from the left to the middle point on the figure. And of course, you need these two cost elements. You need the, 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 the average cost, as I call it here, or the underage cost, or the cost per unit of remaining inventory, which is CO, or the cost per unit of unsatisfied demand, which is CU. Okay, so this is needed to kind of solve it. So we need to kind of capture this information for the, for the Molde Jazz Festival example. And we could, for instance, start with the ticket sales, okay? Here are some recorded ticket sales, uh, ranging from 2005 up in to including 2009. And you see they sold 28,074 tickets in 2005. It increased slightly to 77,081 in 2006. Increased uh, further on into 29,000 around in 2007. Slightly, no, actually it decreased from 2005 to 2006, sorry, 28 down to 27. Then it increased again, increased again a little bit, but it, it's kind of stable, but somewhat different numbers. Okay, the, if you look at these five numbers, there's kind of no clear pattern here, no clear. It seems to be some kind of growing tendency, doesn't it? That at least, but it's not very clear. Again, we kind of typically use this technique as we did in the previous example. We need to kind of transform the ticket demand into the t-shirt demand again. Very simple. In this case, we just assume that a certain proportion of the ticket buyers buy a t-shirt. Uh, in practice, of course, it's slightly more complex because uh, these are the total number of tickets and each person will typically perhaps buy more than one ticket. So there are not as many persons as tickets here. But on the other hand, one person could buy more t-shirts again than one. So uh, using a kind of fraction here doesn't seem very crazy. And of course, again, we can do measurements, just like we did with the Coca-Cola on the stadium. We can observe how many t-shirts do we sell on several festivals and see if we see a clear link between the number of sold tickets and the number of t-shirts, which I presume we do, even though I haven't been able to get the data to check that. Of course, again, and then you can kind of do a regression on that to see if you kind of find a clear link. The more tickets you sell, the more t-shirts you sell. I would expect that to be the case. Of course, depending somewhat on the, on the motif quality. If you have a bad motif one year, probably then you don't see the same link. But in this case, we made it simple and just uh, link up with uh, saying that one third of all tickets produced a single t-shirt, okay? So we just divide the top row numbers by three to produce our t-shirt demand data, and it's 9358, 9027, and so on. So it's just a third of the first row here. Uh, of course, this is limited observations. It's perhaps hard to use the method we discussed when we saw the example in, in the Namias book, where they kind of had a lot of observations. They produced a histogram here. It's very hard. So few, it's kind of difficult to, to foresee using a kind of histogram method here to kind of adapt to a distribution. So we will do use a, a bit more subjective way of kind of looking at it uh, in uh, assigning uh, distributions to this example. But we need some more information. The selling price in 2010 was 180 Norwegian Kron. So that is a correct number. That is just to observe. You can ask somebody who bought one or look at the internet and you will find that. So that, that was the price then. I don't know what the price will be next year. Maybe 250? Of course these prices they have shown an increasing pattern, just following the general cost change in society. The post-festival price uh, has been 30 Norwegian Krones up to now, so it's a big difference here, okay? Yeah. So you have this, uh, even though I say that certain very old t-shirts has become collective objects, of course those ones are much, much more expensive, but in general, one or two or three years after the festival, you kind of can buy last year's t-shirt or t-shirt from two or three years ago for 30 crowns. It's available on the internet actually. 
Then, of course, we need the actual buying price. If it's from China, what do you buy the t-shirts from? And, and you typically prefabric them here. So you decide on the motif, you ship it to some producer, that producer puts it on, and it's a reasonable quality t-shirt and a reasonable high quality print, I think. I don't know if anybody do you have any of these t-shirts and try to wash them. Okay, they, they seem to last for some years at least. So it's not like the very cheapest fabric or the very cheapest print. So I just made a guess here, okay, on the number. I say, okay, let's suppose it's 50 crowns per t-shirt in buy price by buying it. Then, of course, if you can sell it to 180, you're happy. And the reason, of course, that if the buying price here is less than the post-festival price, then you really don't take any risk, do you? So if this number 50 here actually is only 10 crowns, then you can either sell it to 180 or to in infinity for 30, and then you don't really take any risk. So you might as well order as much as possible. So to make it sensible, we need that this number is bigger than this one. And of course, it should be smaller than that one as well. Okay, so these kind of these kind of um, inequality must be present. So the selling price should be smaller than sorry should be larger than the buying price, which again should be larger than the salvage value. That kind of link should be there. If it's broken, if you can buy it even cheaper, then you might as well buy a big deal here especially if the storage costs are small. Of course, it could be if the inventory costs are high enough, you would kind of still limit your buy. So you wouldn't buy an infinite number, but you buy. the problem would be much easier to handle because you don't take any risk by buying. Uh, if you return a little to, to uh, postponement, a very classical type of industry is the fashion industry. They use a lot of postponement. They fabric some different clothes and they launch these clothes, this year's collection, it's these colors, and this year it should be brown perhaps, I don't know. And of course, if they kind of finish producing all their clothes in this color, they would take a major risk, wouldn't they? Because it could happen that the market really don't like this color. So what they do, of course, is that they, they just produce tiny samples here. And then they either they pre-sell it they try to check out how the audience reacts to it. You probably know that when they make films in the United States, they have these previews, don't they? Have you heard about this? You make a film, okay? But you don't make a film, you, you make many films. You make 50, 100, 200 films with different endings, different starts. Same actors typically, but you make changes. And so you put this into theaters and you let these Pilot customers watch these films and they, they tell, tell, tell you what kind of films they like best. And then they pick the one then which they kind of actually launch for the big world market. Again, an example of these kind of tools put into practice. So this these stuff here is actually very important in modern logistics, okay? And it can definitely be applied in events as well. And it is applied a lot in events. Of course, one reason why it's done a lot in event setting is of course that you have this time. You can, you can use this time to pre-manufacture your product, to test. Test manufacturing is often the, the term which is used here. You put it into a test audience to see how they react and then you change it according to these reactions. You probably know that when they make candy or beer, they do the same. Okay. A new beer, different brands, you test it on the audience to see what is best and then you, you make a decision on putting it to the market. All, all kind of to to prevent taking unnecessary risk. <coughs> With these numbers, it's straightforward to, to find this CU. Uh, the underage cost is the kind of cost, the difference between 180 and 30, which produces 150, and CO is 50 min minus 30, which is 20. Uh, again, a typo here, sorry about that. That should be 20, of course, not 29. Be aware of that. <laughs> So then we can, we can compute this fraction we can before we start, because we need this fraction, don't we? It's the right-hand side here. We need that no matter what, so we might, might as well compute that before we start here. <coughs> and in this case, if you put in 20 instead of 29 here, you end up with something close to 0 0.867. <laughs> if you know some probability theory now, you can already know, get a feeling for what will happen here. 
if this is your probability density, what this fraction tells you is that the probability on the left of your Q bar mark should equal 0 0.867. So it's a big amount of probability on the left side here. So you should overbook a lot here. You kind of you should. This is typically the average. Remember when we discussed this, whether you should kind of buy more than the average or less than the average. And, and the point is, of course, is that this value here is very high. 150 is much higher than 20. That is kind of what drives this. It's, uh, it's worse not to satisfy the demand here because you can take such a high price within the event. So you kind of order more than what you kind of expect to sell. That's, that's, that's what we say here. And we kind of move this number. So the probability here is 0 0.867, meaning that the remaining on the right side here is 0 0.133 actually, which is very small, close to 10%. Okay, so the next step now is to look at uh, our probability density. Now we have this fraction, we have C over CU, that's kind of what we need, and then we need this probability density to kind of find the actual number we want to order. And as I said previously, we use a more subjective method uh, looking at a very optimistic FOQ and compared to a high variance alternative. Uh, there is uh, related to, to letters here alpha and beta. And these alpha and beta, they kind of uh, link to the fact that in this example we look at a, a bounded distribution. So we have two numbers here. And the whole distribution is in within these two numbers. So on the left here there is no possible outcome, on the right here there is no possible outcome. Of course a normal density has infinite tails. So there is always a probability that you will find something at the right of you. But if you have finite tails like this, then, uh, then you kind of can say that there are certain parts on the left here where you will not end up. And of course in practice when it comes to selling stuff you will not sell negative numbers. So, so zero could always. But, uh, but what we do here is that we kind of look at our observations, okay? And we had observed some values here, haven't we? We had some, the lowest number and the biggest number. We kind of use, use those as kind of fixing our probability density. Uh, in addition, we assume that since the 2010 festival was a jubileum, we round up 11,562 to 1,300. Okay, so we assume that as it's a jubileum or a kind of anniversary, maybe that's the better English word, we end up uh, normally more hi higher than we did the previous year. So we kind of extend or kind of move our distribution upwards here. Yeah, we move it upwards on the that side, but we move it down here just to kind of to make it easy. So we, we replace this by 9,000 and this by 13,000. So that is kind of uh, how we think about producing our density. So uh, then of course we could ask what kind of type should it be and uh, what I did here was just very simple to use either a kind of maximal variance with highest possible uncertainty on the left which is a uniform distribution and then I kind of included a more optimistic version. Okay, This one is more optimistic isn't it? If you have a triangle like this, you see that kind of the, there's a bigger probability on the right hand side, it's skewed to the right. Okay, so it's more probable to get higher values than low values. Getting very low values has a small area here, by larger values, values has a, a high area. And the probability is always area when we think that these densities. <coughs> so now we have kind of settled the necessary information to produce this. And then we have two different ones, of course. Of course, in practice, we would pick one. But this is just to kind of for showing you how to do this, okay? And of course, then you can kind of make a discussion afterwards which one is the sensible one to use. And then the optimistic guys would vote for this one. The pessimistic old guys would vote for this one. They have to make a vote and then pick which one, okay? Again, in practice, they probably don't do this at this festival. Uh, they, they probably just ordered the number they ordered last year. <laughs> that is one option, isn't it? But, uh, okay. <coughs> so, what we need to do now is to kind of find the mathematical structure of these two probability densities. And then we can compute this 
big F or the distribution function, and then we can equate that to our fraction value, which was 0 0.867, 857, I don't remember. Okay. Let's see. It was 0 0.867, yeah. So what I'm aiming for now is that I have found this number, and I'm trying to establish two versions of this one to produce two versions of that one. Okay. And when I have these two versions of the, that one, I can equate that to 1, 0 0.8. My memory is very bad. 867, yeah. By kind of finding this function and this function, okay? Then I have everything I need and I can make my computations. So, if you look at the, the figures here, or the graphs, you can probably accept that uh, this density has just a constant value here. Let's call that H, okay? So the first probability density looks like this. It has a value of H in a certain interval from 9,000 to 13,000. And it's zero, zero elsewhere. There's nothing here, and nothing here. This one has a linear increasing pattern here. So it's some a plus b times q to produce a straight line. So the other one, if we call this uniform, and this one triangular, ft, triangular, uniform, it would be a plus b q if we are in this interval and still zero elsewhere. And that is what is written here. So this is kind of straightforward. What, what we, the only thing we're lacking now is actually the value for this H and the value for the A and the B. And we need to find those, okay? We need those. We need numbers here to find the actual number to, to order. So to find our nodes, a nodes H, A, and B in order to specify the two density functions. For instance, we can find this H, very simple, by computing the area of a rectangle, can't we? If you look back here, we have an H, which is the height of the rectangle. We have a distance here, which is 13,000 minus 9,000. So if we take that one times that one, we get the area. And as it's a probability density, the area should be 1. Okay? So then we can use that to find the H. It's a straightforward operation. So H times the distance from 9,000 up to 13,000 should equal 1, shouldn't it? So H would then equal 1 divided by the difference here, which is 4,000, isn't it? 13,000 minus 9,000, that's 4,000, so we end up with something here. We end up with 0 0.00025. A very small number. And this is the problem when you start working with numbers, that they kind of get very small or very big or nasty to handle. So I, I prefer not to use numbers as much as I can, but... Uh, if you actually want to do things in practice, you have to use numbers. That's uh, not avoidable at all. So, what about finding A and B here? What should we do? Now we have a triangle here, haven't we? And we know how to compute the area of a triangle, don't we? How do we do that? We need a formula for the a triangle is half of a rectangle, isn't it? Yeah. So if you take the baseline times the height divided by 2, then we have the area. Okay. That's easy. Easy. So we can take... Yeah, we need... Uh, we need a value for this one, don't we? Do we have that? We have that, haven't we? Because we have the function here. 
the function at this point is this distance. This is, if I take a plus b times 13,000, that is the same as the height of the triangle. So I can take that one and multiply it by this distance. It's the same as before. 13,000 minus 9,000. And of course I have to multiply everything, divide everything by 2, which I can do like this. And this should equal 1. This is one equation in two unknowns. So I'm not uh, fully specified yet, am I? I need another equation. What kind of equation could that be, do you think? What information on this figure have we not used so far? Now we have a crossing point of the q-axis, don't we? This point here. What is the value of this function in this point? The function value here, which is, kind of measure, is zero, isn't it? At the crossing point here. So, this is equation one. We can produce a second one here by taking a plus b times this q value, which is 9000, and that one should equal 0. Now I have two equations to find two unknowns, and then, then we are set, aren't we? Because you need to kind of uh, know some simple geometry here to <laughs> be able to do it. Basically that's what's needed. And uh, if we want to fit some kind of densities, this is one way of doing it. Of course you need to know the densities and the functional structures of them, but uh, here's an example on kind of fitting two different ones. Okay, we need to solve these two equations then to find out A and B, don't we? Uh, if you look here, uh, the first one, yes, which is the same as number one there and the second one there, yes. So we have two equations in two unknowns, A and B, which is exactly what is on the board. Of course, now we have to solve these two equations. You know how to solve two equations in two unknowns? You can solve one and put into the other to get a single uh, variable and then solve for that to find the actual solution and then set back into the first one to find the other variable. That is one way. Uh, I think I use a slightly different one here. I, I rewrite the equation slightly. You see that 13,000 uh, minus 9,000 is 4,000. And a half times 4,000 is 2,000. And I should produce 1 over, over 2,000, which is twice 1 over 4,000. 1 over 4,000 was 0 0.000025. Then I get 0 0.5 here. So I can rewrite this equation as that one. I leave that one unchanged, and now I can just subtract these two equations from each other. And the reason is then I can eliminate the a, can't I? Just subtract 315 from 314. So I take this one minus that one. Then I get a minus a, which is zero. I get 13,000 minus 9,000 times b. And that should equal 0 0.005. So then I find the b directly from this equation. 0, 0, 0, 5 divided by 4,000, which is an even smaller number. Okay, a lot of zeros here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, actually. And then, to find uh, the unknown A, I enter that one into that one, for instance, or I could also enter it into the other one, doesn't matter. And then I get A plus this number times 9,000 should equal 0, and A turns out to be minus 0 0.001125 then. So the, this is kind of uh, how to do this exactly. And as you see, if you don't choose your numbers more careful than I did here, you end up with 
ugly numbers. And of course, the reason is that this is, to some extent, trying to be reality. Okay, we use some real demand numbers here. Uh, we, we try to use as much as possible of the real cost numbers as well. So then, then you just end up like this. This is, uh, this is typical reality, okay? As opposed to these exam questions where you kind of get these nice numbers. Then in this case, you did not do that. Okay, now we kind of have what we need in order to make the transition from that part into that part. Okay, we have the two densities. Now we can perform the integrals here to produce two different distribution functions. One for the uniform density and one for the triangular density. Uh, now, I revert to using just letters. Instead of using these long numbers, I just go back and write up the letter versions here. Okay, so I move back into H and A plus B instead of using these numbers because these numbers are so long, so they kind of are tedious. And uh, the risk for a typo is even larger than before. So what I'm wanting to solve now is first this integral. And you see I have Q as a variable alpha here at the bottom, H dQ. And I'm looking then for the function which has H as a derivative. And of course, H times Q. If I take the, if this is F O, o Q, then my, the derivative of this one would be H. So I need this as my integral. So I should enter the upper and lower limit into this one. That would produce H. We often write it like this. The upper limit Q, lower limit alpha. And then we put the upper limit in first. H times Q, and it should be a star here perhaps. No. Not necessarily. Q in for Q and then minus H times alpha. So it's subtract the lower limit from the upper limit. This can be written like H times Q minus alpha if we like. <coughs> you see that in equation G20. This one is slightly more involved because you have two elements here. This A of course runs exactly like the H. So it's A times Q here. But here, the, this Q produces a half Q squared, okay? If my F O Q is a half Q squared, then the derivative of that one is 2 times a half times Q to the power of 2, Q minus 1, which is Q to the power of 1. So that is how I handle finding the integral of this Q. And of course, then I end up with this formula instead. A times Q plus B half times Q squared. Comes directly from, from, from the operation I did here. Then I have to enter the upper limit first. Then I get... Yeah, I've, I've done some rearrangements here, okay? I put, first I put in that one, then I put in that one. And you see I've kind of collected what is has an alpha factor here. I get alpha Q times alpha alpha here, and then I get b halves q squared, b halves alpha squared, which is this part. So I just brought them together slightly different from the obvious, obvious uh, uh, sequence. Okay. Time for a break, maybe? Yeah, time for a break. Now you see, event planning isn't that easy as you, as, as you thought. <laughs> <laughs>